is Joseph Coco. I'm at ACAF 2017 on behalf of Becca Hilburn's Art Process YouTube. If you could introduce yourself, Josh. Sure thing. Uh, I'm Josh Buchanan. I'm a cartoonist and graphic designer. I just like telling stories and making comics. Okay, cool. And what brings you to A2CAF this year? Um, I've actually been coming to, it used to be called Kids Read Comics. I've been coming since 2011 uh, when I really started looking into making comics and they've been gracious enough to you know let me back in nice so how has the show changed uh, in the years that you've been coming here it's gotten bigger and busier yeah uh, much more so okay and um, you're you're local to the area yes I'm only like 40 minutes away from Howell gotcha and for those who don't know this is in um, Ann Arbor district that's the yeah. a2 part of a2 calf yeah um, okay, so uh, how do you feel the accommodations are for the show? Uh, I don't know what types of shows you've done in the past, but um, a lot of shows that Becca does are like anime cons and some craft fairs and some uh, a lot of other independent comic cons, and we found that uh, we're really treated well here. There's people to sit our tables, there's lunch provided. Uh, what's been your experience with that between this and some of the other cons that you've done? Um, I've actually been finding that, uh, granted, A2 Cafe and Kids Read Comics both have had uh, a big focus on taking care of the content creators because we're here to share our knowledge. Yeah. Um, thankfully, I've actually noticed that trend kind of blending over to other conventions that never used to do that. Awesome. Um, Motor City was a great example this year where they actually had, for the first time ever, at least from what I remember, volunteers asking you how you were doing. Like, do you need food? Do you need water? Do you need to take a break? And I was flabbergasted. Like, I only expected that kind of treatment here. Yeah. Which is great treatment. Yeah. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about Scratch 9? Is that your uh, main project for the time? Uh, for right now, it's the biggest one I'm working on. That That's most recent. Um, yeah. Scratch 9 is about a cat who's been experimented on, and now he can summon his previous and future nine lives to come help him. Uh, that was the story of the first book. The second book is he meets another cat who can reverse his powers, and then he quantum leaps back through time and space through all his other lives trying to get back home. Okay. And uh, Scratch 9 was a established series. Uh, you're the artist of the series, correct? Yes. Yeah, okay. Rob, Rob Worley wrote it. Uh, the first series got nominated for an Eisner, so I was excited to work on it. Yeah. And uh, I only did a little bit of ancillary work, some additional covers and uh, small stories in the first volume. And when time came to do the second volume, Robin, again, graciously invited me to be part of it. And I just had a blast doing it. We spent about seven months of 2014 doing all the art and getting it ready for publication. Okay. I knew you work a lot in markers, but Scratch 9 sound digitally, right? Scratch 9 was 100% digital. Um, we, it was colored by DigiCore because, I, uh, to be fair, I don't color fast enough. Um, okay. But I was able to color the first two pages to give DigiCore an idea of what my colors look like. So they were in a yeah. really big bad way Indeed. they were trying to mimic my coloring style fantastic and they, that's and pretty they, flattering honestly it really is they nailed it and like you, you'd almost think that I color this yeah um, but they were really easy to work with and I just try to spend my days through 2014 drawing two pages a day whether it's pencils or inks but yeah it was, it was all two pages a day wow um, did you did you have the thumbnails for that was that provided by the writer or did you no he, he provided yourself? scripts uh, okay. like literally like page like uh, like a movie script, like page one, yeah, panel, panel one. He would break it down like how he thought he would see it. Right. But Rob was so easy to work with that he would, um, if he had something that I thought could work better, then I would suggest it and like just show him visually what I thought. And yeah. there were plenty of times that I envisioned something and he would say, you know what, this is kind of what I was thinking instead, what do you think? And then we would collaborate in a really great way and say like, yeah, this is way better. And we would clearly recognize like, what was a more successful way to communicate a scene? Okay. And I remember uh, one of the Scratch Nines was in one of the free comic book day editions. I don't remember if yes. that was 2015 or 2016. Uh, 13 and 14. Oh, I'm sorry, 13 and 14. Um, I, uh, sorry, I don't know too much about it. How do it's you okay. how do you get um, how do you get into uh, free comic book day edition? I, I know that uh, the stores actually have to buy those issues that they give away for free. Yes, right? they do. It's it's a it's an interesting process. Um, the publishers know a little bit more about it. Okay. What happens is is um, you have essentially you have sponsors paying the free comic book day you know program sponsoring yeah. them for certain, like gold sponsorship, silver sponsorship, and essentially a publisher paying them enough to actually feature them as either like let's say like Marvel pays them a certain amount of money and yeah. they're entered in as a gold sponsor. That means that they will print more books of the gold sponsors to send to more stores for them to to order. Okay, mostly just because you know. 
comic book stores will order Marvel and DC because it's what they know. So it's very familiar. They'll order it. It's, sure. It's not, it's a, honestly, that's what a lot of fans are probably yeah, it's a sure shot, thinking so. is coming down the pipe. Especially so. if they have to pay for them. So if, uh, yeah. like, let's say Hermes Press was publishing, which they did, they published Scratch 9, and they afforded a silver sponsorship, there weren't as many copies sponsored because they didn't think... You know, they weren't going to pay more money for it to be gold sponsored when not many stores knew how to order it or even knew to order. Sure. So essentially, it's just about sponsorships and like how much you pay to get it into the free comic book day program. Okay. I don't exactly so know how much it that is. would be something that's near impossible for an independent artist to, to get into. You think? I don't know actually. Um, you'd be surprised. Um, okay. I wouldn't be surprised to see any independent artists getting in there, just either forking up their own money or doing a Kickstarter or a Patreon. Yeah, a Kickstarter um, actually might not be a bad idea. I wouldn't be surprised if that started happening yeah, within honestly, the next couple like, of years. Honestly, like this whole, like everything that I do behind the table pays for itself, thankfully now. It didn't used to. But now everything like pays for the next event or pays for the next venue. Yeah, And just fantastic. try to like, you just try to manage your money as best you can. So, um, you don't need to share numbers or anything like that, but is, um, is doing art for like Scratch 9 and things like that your day job? No, my day job is actually, uh, I'm a graphic designer, so I work in the apparel industry. Okay. Um, but every day on my lunch hour, and then when I go home before, after the kids go to bed, yeah, you're working. I'm working. So it's like maybe, I was telling, somebody asked me earlier, I was like between one and three hours a day working on comic book stuff, specifically. Okay. Um, oddly enough, I get a lot more, I got a lot more done now that I have less time to do it. Yeah, I was going to say, I, it sounds like you're pretty efficient because, like, just watching what weird. you produce online. Like. It's weird because, like, <laughs> when I, I used to have no job and I wasn't producing anything. And then I got a job yeah. and I started producing a little bit more. And then the kids came along and I'm producing even more. It's, it's very interesting. It's a weird dichotomy of push and pull for, like, pulling time out of nowhere just to make stuff. Yeah. It's weird. So I see the camp pencil point here. Are you involved in that? I know you said you're a local, and I talked to Rachel Polk about it a little bit. Oh, sweet. Yeah, we're actually, um, her, Jofu, me, Mike Roll are like the big players in camp pencil point work. Um, we'll be doing demos, teaching people how to draw on YouTube or at Maker's Fair or even here at Kids Read Comics. A2 Cap, sorry. Yeah, um, that's fine. I was it always was, called Kids, Kids Read, Comics. Read Comics longer than it was A2 Cap. So. It rolls off the tongue so yeah. easy. <laughs> But um, a two calf sounds a little more hipster, I think. A little so bit. I could say. But then you say like T calf, yeah, and T calf rolls off really quickly. So I understand why they did it. You know, just to make it a little bit more approachable for everyone, rather than thinking, oh, it's just for kids. Yeah. yeah. But um, yes, I am involved with Kent Pencil Point to a degree of like shooting videos. We shot a video at Motor City, and just trying to help out as much as I can. Okay, fantastic. And um, that's every year. Uh, make, uh, Maker's Fair? Uh, the the Camp Pencil Point. Uh, we're going to be trying to do that as a year-round event where we actually make videos to teach people how to draw. Oh, okay. Either awesome. on YouTube or at events like Maker's Fair or a 2 Cap. Yeah, so um, you just do, you show up at events when, when it's appropriate, when exactly. you think there'll when, be an audience there? Hopefully when it's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> and, and right. We do hope for their audience, but Henry Ford actually planned for us to have a space and actually wow. run like our little uh, run our tables essentially after the seminar. So we were just like, "That's bonkers." Uh, yes, please. So okay. we're just very gracious for that, grateful for that. How, how did you get involved with um, Camp Pencil Point? Um, what hap I've known those guys for a few years now, and. Yeah. Um, Joe had started a few years ago and started shooting. He actually shot a video of me and Rob when we were here back in 2014. Rob Stenzenker? Oh, Rob Worley, who had okay. written Scratch yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, Rob Worley. That's okay. Involved. Also great Rob. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, we met him here last year for the first time. He's so. cool. He's a yeah. nice guy. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, he couldn't be here this year. But yeah. yeah. Probably scheduling. Yeah. But um, I've known them for a long time, and I love their work. So when the time came for them to shoot a video with me and Rob and Puppets... I was like, yeah, sure, let's do this, because I love working with puppets. Yeah, I and saw the promotional video uh, yesterday, I think, that Jersey put up for uh, A2K. Oh, that was fun. That looked yeah. cool. Yeah, this is a Rankin from uh, Galaxy Super Adventure. Yeah. Um, but uh, once Joe Fu started planning, like, hey, let's start this program, let's start this, you know, get this up and running again, because he's had a few he's had a few things in life kind of stop that from happening. Sure. So he wants to get up and running, and he remembered me loving working with him, so he's like, Hey, you want to do this again? So I was like, instant yes. Just because awesome. he's fun to work with. Yeah. And it's targeted mostly at kids or anyone who wants uh, to A little draw? bit of everybody. Hopefully, probably will be mostly kids just because we are having the puppets involved. Yeah. But honestly, like, who doesn't like a puppet? Yeah. There might be a rare few that don't. 
<laughs> I've seen some shirts today of uh, Bring Back the Muppets. So. Yeah, Bring Back the Muppets. <laughs> um, so, and one last question I wanted to ask on uh, Free Comic Book Day. Um, did, did you find that, I mean, I don't know how much analytics you have on Scratch 9, but did you find that Free Comic Book Day helped your numbers? Um, I don't know if you're just receiving, like... Uh, I don't really know checks? much about the numbers in terms okay. of... Yeah, I, yeah. I, did, I haven't... Um, I honestly know nothing about the analytics of how much, how well it did. Um, okay. The only thing I know is that they were running out, which I'm like, that's good? Probably. That or they didn't print I know they ordered a certain number of copies. It was like, like 20,000 copies was last I heard. Yeah, that's pretty but, good. But uh, knowing like, okay, you sold out of those, that's great. So like, let me order some, and that's all I know. Okay. Um, but yeah, I don't really know much about how it Im- Im- impacted the sales on uh, the trade paperback because Free Comic Book Day came and the book was in there, but at the same time, the trade wasn't going to come out until later that year, so it was kind of hard to like correlate the two. Um, yeah. Now, if, it, if they were doing a floppy comic as originally planned, they probably could have watched it a little bit closer, but it's just the plans changed and Free Comic Book Day was hard to track how it would impact the sales. I understand. Yeah, I was just curious. So It was just fun to be a part of. Um, I know you do a lot of uh, marker work and commissions and those sort of things. Can you tell me a little bit about your process for that? Uh, don't mess up. <laughs> yeah. I, you, uh, it's, it's just you usually a, don't do line work, right? Or do you start with line work? I actually start with the line work. It just starts looking like pencils. Oh, okay. And from there, I'll ink it with a brush. And after that, if I feel good enough about the drawing, I'll start going with the gray scale on the, uh, first, yeah. and then I'll lay the Copics down on top of that. Um, just because when you lay grays on top of color Copics, it actually dilutes the color, and the gray starts sure. to actually show more than the actual uh, color that you wanted. Other Versus the color on top of gray, it, it does exactly what you want it to do. Okay. Do you find that um, grayscale things does well at a, a kids convention? Heavens no. Yeah. I'd, no, I was I, curious, because, I mean, it looks beautiful, but for some reason kids are attracted to the bright color. colors. Everything's color. <laughs> um, these were actually just Inktober drawings I did last year. Oh, fantastic. Um, they're, to, they're pretty big for Inktober, every, uh, doing one a day. I mean, Every year I try to do something that's different than the year previous. Like Originally, it all started with the sketch cards, which are tiny, because it was something easy for me to tackle by using a brush. And yeah. that was my goal, was learn how to use a brush. And then every year I've added some other complication, just because you know I like to make my life a little bit more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's find a way to make this harder to do. So then I added greystone, and I added color, and then I started drawing bigger, and I have, like, 5x5 five five drawings from, like, back in 2015 yeah. that I did for Inktober. And then finally, I'm like, hey, let's pull out all the stops. Let's do full 8.5x11 and do grayscale. That was this year? That was 2016. Or 2016? Yeah, sorry. This the, year? The last Inktober. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> you I don't have to find do, a way to one up yourself. I don't know if I want to do full colors. Just, just use your use your left hand this year. That'll oh, <laughs> be quite the handicap. I think I might lose some followers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so you you've been doing October for uh, how like many years? Five or six years now. About as long as I've been doing kids read A two cap. Yeah, kids read A two cap. Caught yourself. Um, so what's been your experience with that? Are you picking up a lot of followers doing that? I don't know how many kids actually follow. Certainly a lot of artists follow Inktober. Um, uh, and some fans as well of people who just Inktober, uh, enjoy consuming. Inktober is mostly other artists engaging with other artists. Yeah. I mean, there's very few times where I've actually engaged a lot with somebody who like, may not draw or just not that interested, but they just like seeing cool artwork. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Inktober mostly opens up like conversation avenues for other artists, okay. at least for me. And um, what's uh, generally like your turnaround time for commissions and uh, your process for like communicating with people or whatever? Do you do you mostly get commissions at shows or online? Mostly at shows, and if I'm full up, then I just tell them I take it online, and I'll you know I'll send you pencil proofs and ink proofs, and just involve them in the process as much as possible. Yeah. Um, but turnaround so time, if communication is is important, and that's the oh, big, big time, big yeah. time. And if, and if they're on the ball and they're always replying to emails and messages, then I can get a commission done in a day or two days, depending on the, nice. the difficulty of it. Something like this might take me like like a day to ink, and like to pencil layout and ink, and then maybe a day, day and a half to color. It just depends on the difficulty of what they're wanting. Right. Uh, so for your more cartoony style stuff, like what's in Scratch 9 and so forth, are you doing perspective grids or are you just laying things down? I'm just laying things down. There's, okay. there's a few times that I'll lay down a perspective grid, something that Joe Fu knows a lot about. Because okay. he actually teaches at CCS perspective drawing. Oh, nice. Um, 
and there's a few times where if I have to really actually this is a great case so I have to lay out the drawing and figure out like I might lay a grid down to see like are these legs working right or like are these positioned the right way yeah so how, basically how, if, if you're concerned if I'm concerned I'll lay it down yeah. if I'm not that concerned I honestly just go with it like, yeah I think and this I think was the last time I did itself it well too. that's that's kind of what made me ask because I thought it looked good it definitely doesn't look wrong but I wasn't sure if you actually use perspective grids uh, just, and most of my perspective, yeah, no, most of my perspective grids are actually just freehand because I'm just like I'm just trying to get it done. Yeah. Every time I every time I put a straight edge down and I'm really trying to focus on it, I overthink it. It gets distracting I and you're not getting the actual work done. Yep. And then I think like, well, if I just did all that with a straight edge, how am I going to ink this with a straight edge? Because I can't ink with a straight edge yet because yeah. I have a brush and yeah, that's pros can do it, but I can't do it. I've yeah, tried. I actually talked to uh, the artist that does um, Monkey Chef, and he said he uses a straight edge with a brush pretty regularly, and that kind of surprised That's me because I, I had never talked That's to hard. yeah an artist before that uses a brush and a straight edge, but he was like, it's just how I learned to do it. So the it, first time it I heard it me. mentioned was uh, Frank Miller. Frank Miller talked about doing it. I'm like, what? He doesn't ink, and he really <laughs> didn't originally, but now he does ink. Okay. But um, yeah, I would never have imagined a straight edge with a brush. Because it's like, then you have to worry about your pressure, your angle, and just like get it perfect. And yeah. There's no such thing. Yeah. There's only satisfactory. It, it also just seems strange because the brush is so like free, free flowing. Yeah. But a ruler is just like, no, I just want a straight line. Yes. Yeah. Just a little to bit of a dichotomy, but. Yeah. Um, so, can you tell us about uh, conventions that you're planning on doing in the near future and any work that you have coming down the pipes? Um, the next one I'll be doing is Maker's Fair in Detroit, yeah. which yeah. is at the Henry Ford. Um, that will be two days at the end of July. And then the one after that, I think it's literally the following week, is in Brighton, which is really close to where I live. It's called okay. LibCon. It's uh, the Howell Library and the Brighton Library put on a convention much like this and just invite people to come much like this for free. Yeah. And they don't charge to, to admit anybody, which is pretty cool. Um, they actually asked me what games I could run. So I'm like, I know a little bit about Quick Draws. So I'm <laughs> nice. running Quick Draws at LibCon. Yeah. And I think that one's August... First week of August, I believe. I'll have to double-check my map on that one, or my okay. calendar on that one. All right. Yeah, and I'll post it in the description beneath the video. Okay. Um, so, uh, what work do you have coming out? Uh, Scratch Nine Worlds uh, came out... Almost uh, two about, years ago now. Okay, I was going to say a year and a half. It seemed like it had been a little while, so... It's been a while. August will be two years. Okay. Um, what are you What are you thinking is going to be released next? Uh, definitely this, this Scotland comic I want to get underway. Okay. Like where I've started thumbnailing it, and I've just been working on concept art for the past six or seven months, just trying and to. You're find writing the story. and illustrating that. Writing and illustrating. Back to back to how I started, which was how I started with the rocket. Are you planning on uh, self-publishing that or pitching it out? Uh, probably self-publishing. I'm just trying to find the right printer who can do the right format that I want to do. Sure. Which is probably gonna be like smaller, almost like uh, Luke Pearson's uh, Hilda books, which I adore. Yeah. But like smaller form narratives that are still long. Was short enough to like stand alone, but somehow tie into the following book. Yeah, it's just a nice, it's a really nice format he's got. And I just adore it because it's just it, aesthetically, it looks amazing. It looks okay. great on a shelf. It makes people turn their heads and like wonder what you're reading. It's like, oh, it's a comic, and nobody believes you. Yeah, I've only read a few of the Hilda books. So good, sure. I love them. Okay. Um, and when might we be able to expect that coming out? Like 2018, 19? Um, I'm aiming for 2018. Okay. So I'm Sounds working. Good. I'm working on the pages right now. So hopefully 2018 will be the first book. Yeah. So here's I hoping. understand all this takes time because it's it's full color, right? <clears throat> I'm planning on full color. Yeah. And where can we find your work online? Uh, just JoshuaDraws.com. And from there you can find me on Twitter, Tumblr, and the empty hallway that is Google Plus. <laughs> That almost nobody knows uses. Yeah, it's like you hide into a. I assume you're mentioning that because I follow you on Google Plus. You're, you're the only one that follows me on Google Plus. <laughs> there's a few yeah, others. Yeah, there's a will. certain type of crowd, and it's not usually comic artists, unfortunately. But yeah, I know it's sad. Okay. There's so much potential to be had too. All right, and uh, finally, what advice would you have for someone who is planning on tabling at A2 CAF as an artist for the first time? Hmm. What would I tell past me? Yeah. Make stuff. And then bring it. Okay. That's it. So just roll with the punches, basically. Pretty as much. As long as you have your comics, you'll, you'll be okay. You it's the only way you learn. All right. Well, thank you, Josh. I hope you have a great A2 calf. Thanks. I already have had one. Thank you. It's the tail end, just in case anyone wondering.